Do you remember the good old days? Yeah, the good old days. Webster's Dictionary defines the good old days as a period of time in the past that seems more pleasant or better than the times we're presently in. That's a pretty wide-ranging definition. You can apply it however you'd like. Um, You know, I think you probably have a season of life that you look back on with fondness. You remember some things that you wish you could go back and do all over again. Yeah. You got a dictionary? Okay, well, there are two tools that I think no person should be without. The first is a dictionary, so you can spell your words correctly. And the second is a thesaurus, so you don't always say the same thing. And I keep those two right at hand when I'm preparing my sermons. So I'm right there with you, Miss Jenny. Thank you for that. But, you know, we look back on these good old days and we mourn their passing. And often it seems like they're gone because of things that are beyond our control. You know, things like the passing of time. You can't stop that. The second hand is, is always ticking. And pretty soon, the good times you're in give way to the next times. And maybe they're good, maybe they're not, but you always look back with fondness. You look, you look at things like, this is probably where we're most guilty. We attribute the loss of the good old days to social or political changes, right? Or maybe just the reality of our, our own mortality, that none of us can escape it. Our kids are going to grow up and one day they're going to lay me in the ground. That's just the way it is. But what if we were actually responsible for losing the good old days? What if it wasn't attributable to some changes beyond our control? But what if we were the problem? In Isaiah 64, I think Isaiah is looking back on God's activity with a longing and nostalgia where where he remembers the good old days when God was present and powerful for his people. And when he looked at the present moment, there was some kind of mismatch. This wasn't concocted, idealized version of the good old days. This was reality. And he knew that the reason was because the people had sinned. And so what Isaiah wanted, what he was desperate for, was for God to do what he had done back then again. And I just want to kind of cut to the chase with y'all here who are present with us this morning and watching online. Um, Do you share his desperation? Do you want to see God do now what we've heard about him back then. I don't want to believe that the good old days are all behind us. I want to believe that God has yet to do the most magnificent things that I'm going to see in my lifetime. And so if you share that desperation, if you're like, man, I do not feel close to God, but I I want to feel close to him again, you are here for a reason because we're going to open up this passage, and see how we can seek God's presence. Because here's the deal. The price of sin is a loss of God's presence, but he'll come again when we repent. The price of sin, the price of a life of sin is a loss of God's presence, but he'll come again when we repent. And that's exactly what Isaiah lays out here. Isaiah was a prophet uh, who prophesied in Jerusalem in the 8th century BC in in a world that was turning upside down. First 39 chapters deal with some historical situations where uh, the king of Samaria, the king of Israel um, were attacking the kingdom of Judah. They were worried about the Assyrian empire on the ascendancy. I mean, things were really chaotic and Isaiah had a front row seat to it all. But the second half of his book is taken up with God's message about the future destiny of his people. A new heavens and a new earth that God was going to establish through his servant, his chosen one, who was going to suffer on his behalf. And Isaiah saw that on their way to glory, the people were going to suffer too. In fact, the prayer we see in Isaiah 64 is a prayer of lament 
over the destruction of Jerusalem, and especially the temple. I don't know if you noticed, he said, our beautiful house. That's the temple. And the amazing thing is that the temple wasn't destroyed um, for another hundred years after Isaiah passed away. And so what God gives Isaiah is a glimpse of the future. And that future is dark. And as he witnesses it, he's brokenhearted and cries out to God, how could you let this happen? See, Isaiah knew that in God's history with his people, he had proved that he was willing to be powerfully present on behalf of his people. That's the way God was. I mean, when you look in the Old Testament, you see it over and over and over again. Back in the good old days, God was everywhere doing amazing and miraculous things. How could he let something like this devastation happen to his chosen people? Of course, we could look at all kinds of places in the Old Testament that could take up the sort of language Isaiah uses when he says, no nation's ever seen a God like you. I mean, of course, there's plenty of material, but obviously, as we've already seen this morning, I think that Isaiah has in the back of his mind God's descent and meeting with his people at Mount Sinai. Uh, he says in verse 1, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. You take that phrase, that the mountains might quake at your presence, and you compare it Venn diagram style to what you read in Exodus 19, and you see there's a great deal of overlap. You hear this from Exodus 19. It came about on the third day when it was morning, that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. I mean, all this, all this language, it's like Isaiah is begging God to come down as he did at Sinai and prove himself to be powerfully present for his people. God's self-revelation at Sinai included the manifest, manifestation of his glory. Uh, I was reading in Exodus 19 this morning, and uh, the, Moses and the elders of Israel go up and they see God, and he's sitting on a shiny surface. It's like the most brightly polished marble you've ever seen in your life. They see him. I mean, that is amazing. God's glory displayed to his people. Of course, that glory accompanied the giving of the law. And we read that in the very next chapter after God descends in Exodus 20, he gives the 10 commandments. It included the revelation of his covenant name when he hides Moses in a rock and passes by him and allows him to see his back, right? He announces the Lord, the Lord, compassionate, gracious, slow in anger, and abounding in steadfast love. It includes his promise in Exodus 34 to be with his people when they took possession of the promised land. I mean, God was powerfully present. Nobody there at Sinai had any doubts. Is our God with us? Look at the smoke and fire. Hear the trumpet blast. God's here. And Isaiah sees this vision of a desolate Jerusalem and starts to think to himself, hey, I wonder what would have made a difference here. I wonder when all these nations come in and ransack the city, I wonder what could have kept it from happening. Maybe if God had to rend the heavens and came down and manifested his glory like he'd done at Sinai, it wouldn't be the people of Israel trembling. Instead, it'd be the nations because he'd reveal his name. And to his people, he's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. But to his enemies, our God is a consuming fire. And that's what Isaiah wishes would happen. He wants some of the good old days in the now. And I think that's where our good old days come in for me. Uh, I'm not thinking about the good old days like the stories my dad tells me about when he was a kid and could go up to the corner candy store on his bicycle, buy a bag full of candy for a quarter. You know, that's awesome. Or fill up your gas tank with a loose change in your car. Nothing like that. That's not the good old days I'm interested in, you know? <laughs> The good old days I'm talking about are those distinct periods in our lives when we have felt God's presence nearby. And I know, like, for me, 
I remember back when I was just a kid, 14 years old, and had given my life to Jesus and got baptized. I was, as we say, on fire, as on fire as Mount Sinai. Everywhere I went, I was convinced God was with me. I was, I was telling people about Jesus left and right. I woke up every morning so excited to read my Bible. I was on fire. And if you're like me, there are seasons when you're not like that. You're not on fire at all. I look back in church history, and I see powerful moves of God sweeping across America. You know, during the first great, great awakening, during the 1730s, 40s, and 50s, 50,000 people were saved in New England. That's amazing when you consider the tiny population that was there at the time, when western Massachusetts was an unexplored wasteland. Okay, like 50,000 people is a lot. I read about the Welsh revival of 1904 that began when 18 teenagers, like y'all's age, got together in a church building and just said, hey, we're hungry for God to move in our generation. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed until God moved. And it swept over Wales and all through Great Britain and all across the world. Why doesn't God move like that again? Those are the good old days when people came to church ready to meet with him. When people were in their bedroom kneeling beside their bed. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? When people cared, right? Why doesn't God move like that anymore? I know God doesn't change. What gives? Well, Isaiah shows us in verses 5 and 7 what had changed. He says, You meet with him who rejoices in doing righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. All right, so the past two weeks we've been talking about seeking God's presence. Here's the, here's the promise. God's ready to meet with us if we delight in doing his will, if we pursue righteousness. But here's the problem. You were angry, for we sinned, and we continued in them a long time. I mean, the sins were so bad to Isaiah, he had to even wonder out loud, is it even possible for you to save a wicked people like us? That's a problem. Isaiah saw that the reason the good old days had passed away is because the people had given themselves to a life of sin, and God can't bless persistent sin. Just he can't do it. He can't do it. In Isaiah's day, the people had all but abandoned their covenant with God. They'd covered over their idolatry and immorality with a thin veneer of routine and ritual, just kind of going through the motions. Isaiah talks about it over and over through his book. Isaiah 58 is powerful. God says, hey, you're going through all your fasts and asking why I'm not here in your prayers, but is this not the fast I desire? to do justice, to do kindness to the oppressed. That's what God was after. He says in Isaiah 29 that even though they were saying all the right words, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And according to Isaiah, the price they paid for all this sin was a loss of God's presence. When, when the heat got turned up around them, God was nowhere to be found. You see, God is perfect. Can we agree on that? God's perfect. He's like pure righteousness, unmixed with anything. James says there's no shadow or variation due to change. I mean, God is just who he is, and he's perfect. And he told his people through Moses in Leviticus 19 that he was calling them to share in his character. He said, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And so he gave them his law, his Ten Commandments, and he gave them the additional statutes, identifying all kinds of circumstances and situations in which their sinful natures were bound to lead them. And if they would have committed themselves to that righteousness, it would have led them to conformity with his character. But of course, they couldn't. Instead of being distinct from the nations of the earth, they were totally unidentifiable as the people of God. Generation after generation after generation had gone their own way, every one of them like a sheep that had gone astray. Until finally, God handed them over. It was like C.S. Lewis said, there's two kinds of people in the world. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. That's it. 
And so eventually the people's commitment to their sin meant that God handed them over to the Babylonians and they came in and ransacked Jerusalem, tore down the temple until there was no stone left on the other and left it in a heap of ruins. God can't bless persistent sin. And if that seems harsh to you, it's probably because we are in such a habit of making excuses for our sin. We think, this is how I think about it, right? I think of my sin as mistakes, missteps. Or worse, it's a personality flaw, you know, or character quirk. It's just part of who I am. And people sometimes say, I got my anger from my dad. You know, my dad had a temper and I've got it too. You know, like it's somehow genetic. But the reality of it is, is that Isaiah reacts towards his sin totally differently than us. He was so desperate for God's presence that he quickly acknowledged the people's guilt and, and wondered if it was even possible for them to be saved. Can we be saved? I mean, his description of sin in verses 6 and 7, we're going to look at it here in a second, get ready. It's so comprehensive. One commentator said it's the Old Testament's most complete description of sin. And I think he's right. It, it provides a multifaceted view to help us really understand what's happening when we give ourselves to sin. First, Isaiah says that the people's sin had defiled them. He says in verse 6, All we have become like one who's unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. They're like people who are ritually impure and therefore not allowed to enter into God's presence without some kind of cleansing. They're defiled. Jesus taught about this. He told his disciples in Matthew 15 when he was reacting to the Pharisees who were losing their minds because he didn't go through all the rituals of washing his hands and plates said in Matthew 15, 17, don't you see that whatever goes into your mouth passes into your stomach and then is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And now that defiles a person. For out of the heart come all kind of evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. And these are what defile a person. Pharisees thought God was all concerned with the externals. But Jesus says, no, your real problem, the real sin comes from within. While we treat sin as if it's harmless, the Bible tells us over and over and over that sin is deadly to the person who lives in it. It corrupts us. It's corrosive like acid. It does violence to our souls and often even to our bodies. And all this sin makes us filthy in God's sight, putrid because of our wickedness. So bad that even those behaviors that we might point to as proof that we're trying really hard, God, our righteousness, our filthy rags before him. So sin defiles us. Isaiah also says in verse 7 that sin deadens us. Oh, this is, sorry, the second half of verse 6. All of us wither like a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Because of the people's persistent sin, they were dead, like a dried up leaf. Ain't it weird how leaves do that? Beautiful cycle of the year. In the spring, they bud and leaf out. In the summer, they're green. But come fall time, it gets cold out. The leaf withers up and dies, and it falls on the ground, and it, it's blown everywhere. And Isaiah says sin has the same effect in us, that sin disconnects us from the life-giving source, and whatever we might draw up from the branch, eventually we wither and we die. Psalm 1 says that the person who dedicates themselves and meditates on the law of God is like a tree that's planted by streams of water and always produces fruit, and its leaf never withers. And it says the wicked are not so, but they're like chaff that the wind drives away. Isaiah said their sin had dead in them. They were shriveled up. They're the dry bones of Ezekiel's prophecy. And of course, the New Testament attests to the deadening effects of sin too. Paul says in Ephesians 2 that by nature we're all dead in the trespasses and sins in which we walk. 
It says in Romans that the wages of sin is death. I mean, God can't bless persistent sin because when we give ourselves to sin, we cut ourselves off from the source of life, which is God himself. And, and the result, every time, I mean, you, you, you try it out for yourself or just think about your life and prove otherwise. Every time you give yourself to sin, it leads to destruction, death, withering from within. But finally, in verse 7, Isaiah does say that their sin made them indifferent to God. It defiled them, it deadened them, and it made them indifferent to God. He said, there's no one who calls on your name who arouses himself to take hold of you. Well, that's an indictment. Having thrown themselves into a life of sin, God is an afterthought. None of them concerned, none of them shakes themselves out of bed in the morning. Hey, get up, hurry, you need to get up and get with God. No, they had lost interest in him and were desensitized to his leading. So the obvious result was that he had hidden his face from them. Unconcerned with God, he turns his back on them. Isaiah had already talked about this in Isaiah 59. You can go back and read that chapter. He says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it can't save, nor his ear dull that it can't hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue mutters wickedness. Listen, God cannot bless persistent sin. And the price his people pay for it is a loss of his presence. Now, I think this is probably one of those places where, and you're quiet, so I'm assuming that you, you know what I'm talking about. It's one of these places where it hits home. Because sometimes you look at your life and you ask yourself, or, and maybe even you ask God, hey, God, why is nothing going right for me? Why does it seem like none of my prayers are being answered? We wonder why God doesn't bless us. You know, we look at our nation and we're brokenhearted because there's so many problems that our nation faces. And of course, we know that if people would just commit themselves to God, all those problems would work itself out, that you can't, no political party is going to solve our crisis. It's going to take Jesus changing hearts. But of course, we know it, but what do we do about it? For so many of us, we've made peace with our sin, settled into a mediocre life, you know, going through the motions and the rituals. And the church is the worst place of all, unfortunately. Not our church, thankfully. We're the exception to the rule. <laughs> of all the places on the face of the earth, our beautiful house, our beautiful house where our fathers worshipped you, and the church in America is on life support. Every year, the statistics come out, and you're like, maybe this is the year we turn things around. It's like, no. They tell us now, the thousands of churches we would have to plant every year in the state of Texas just to keep up with the people moving in from out of state is mind-blowing. Uh, and we want to make a dent in it. You know, for generations, the church has exchanged life-changing encounters with God for events, ministry events. We've given up his presence for, you know it, programs. Thinking, hey, this is, you know what, we've got this great new thing LifeWay's just come out with, a new strategy for reaching the next generation. We've got a new plan the way we're going to start churches all over this country, it's going to be amazing. None of them work. I guess we can't expect God to move with power in our worship services when we're satisfied with going through the motions. That's the lesson I draw. It doesn't matter your strategy or program. If God's not in it, if he doesn't rend the heavens and come down and do what he did before, none of it's going to work. I mean, there are 168 hours in a week. 
And how many people are content giving God the hour and a half on Sunday morning? You know, I did the math. If the only time you thought about God during your week was Sunday morning from 10.45 to 12 or 12.15 if the preacher goes too long, that's less than 1% of the time in your week. 99% of your time, what's your mind on? I mean, Isaiah knew exactly why the good old days had gone away, exactly why Jerusalem was in ruins, exactly why God wasn't present powerfully for his people. They had given themselves up to defiling, deadening sin that made them totally indifferent to God. And he'd turned his back. And I wonder if our lives aren't lacking God's presence and power for the same thing. You know, have we, have we given ourselves to God consistently, wholeheartedly, or have we given ourselves to a life of persistent sin? Which is, have we made peace with anger? Jealousy, covetousness, which Paul says is idolatry. None of y'all bow down and worship an idol in the morning, but how many of us struggle with covetousness? Have we made peace with lust? And God can't bless persistent sin. And so that's the cost. The price we pay for a life of sin is a loss of God's presence. Think about it. Just real quick. We'll take maybe 10 seconds prayerfully. Do you know of any persistent sins in your life? Well, Isaiah knew the people had some areas of sin. And so what could he do? Right, God's powerfully present for his people in the past, but he's totally nowhere to be found now because we've been living in persistent sin. What hope do I have? Well, Isaiah cast himself completely on the mercy and grace of God because he believed that God would return to his people if they'd repent. And that's what he does in the last four verses, five verses of chapter 64. He says, now, O Lord, you're our father, We're the clay, and you are our potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Behold, look now, all of us are your people. I love Isaiah, and you look throughout the scriptures. No author of scripture is afraid to do this, and I don't think any Christian should be either. Isaiah reminds God of who he is and who the people are. Wholeheartedly, he says, hey, these are the promises you've made to us. We are your people. You're our father. You know that Isaiah talks about this, that Israel is God's son. This is who they are. They, they view themselves in this covenant relationship with God so intimate that they are the work of his hands the same way that a potter would shape clay to make it into a vessel for honorable use running its hands over every piece. There's not a place on that piece of pottery that the potter hasn't put his hands, that he hasn't thought about. That's who Isaiah reminds God they are. We are the works of your hands. How could you let this happen to us? I like the way one pastor said it. He said, Isaiah knew that God's glory was tied up in the people's good. That if God let the people suffer like that long term, people would really raise some questions about how faithful God was after all. And so Isaiah didn't fear the repercussions of seeking forgiveness. He knew that God was faithful and he was bound to find it. If he would just cast himself completely on the grace, the grace, God's grace, the grace that'll pardon, you know, the grace I'm talking, the grace we've sang about all morning, if Isaiah would cast himself on that grace, he would find mercy and forgiveness, and God would return to his people. It'd be like it was in the past. So he laid his heart out, and he trusted God. And it's sad for Isaiah that he didn't get to see the fulfillment of his prayer. He didn't get to see God restore his people to Jerusalem, bring them out of exile, But he did get to see Jesus, in a sense. His prophecies are so crystal clear about him, the suffering servant who would take on the sins of his people to die in their place. And in the fullness of time, God did send forth his son. 
born of a woman and under the law to redeem those who were under the law. Of course, it was unexpected. This time there wasn't thunder and clouds and fire and smoke. It's a little baby born in a manger, left to live a life of perfect obedience. Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, he had no beauty that we should desire him. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God. But he was pierced through for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. That's Jesus. Jesus came and lived the sinless life that God's people should have lived never giving himself in any way to the sin that would defile him. He was perfectly righteous, never giving the sin that would deaden him. He was always sensitive and in tune with what the Father wanted. My will is to do the one of him who sent me. Everywhere he went, he obeyed God. And then in his death, he dealt with sin and its defiling and deadening influence for all time. So the promise of the Bible is if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then, because after three days in the tomb, he came out again, raised from the dead, never to die again, he makes a promise that anybody who trusts in him receives from him newness of life. They're born again. The deadening influence of sin erased so they can offer themselves wholeheartedly to God as instruments of righteousness. And someday, we believe, he's going to bring us to live with him forever, right? In a new heavens and a new earth, and a body that's immortal and incorruptible, free from the deadening influence of sin once and for all. But for now, we have his spirit, his ongoing, personal, and powerful presence not outside of us, on a mountaintop to point to and look at, but within us, to lead us and guide us and to work in us, to create hope, Paul says in Romans 15, to transform us into his image in Romans 8, that always the Spirit is bearing testimony with our spirit that we are sons of God and we cry out to him, Abba, Father, we have God with us now. And so, church, the good old days aren't God's final word in our lives or church. Better things, greater things are coming. For no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. It doesn't matter how far you've drifted or how badly you've fallen, Though the price of sin is a loss of God's presence, he'll return again when we repent. Will you bow with me this morning as we pray?